Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the podcast. I'm excited because this next guy, yo, he's a legend. You know, we love hip hop over here. This next guy, you heard the intro already. We have none other than the founder of The Source, The Source Magazine, The Source Awards, now running things at Hip Hop Weekly. The one and only Dave Mays is on a podcast. How you doing, bro? Doing great. Thanks for having me. Listen, man, when, when, you know, we got the, the thought process of getting you on this show. I was just so excited because, you know, we're hip hop heads over here. I know a lot of people right now, they're Google searching you. People are probably already familiar with your name, but there's always, you know, that person that is listening to our show. This might be the first time. Take us back to the young Dave, right? Where are you from? Uh, so I'm, I'm born and raised in Washington, D.C. Um, so, you know, I came up in a time where, you know, I just got exposed at an early age to kind of the music and the culture of what was going on in, 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 in the city and just really, you know, took a, a liking to that. And, um, you know, I, uh, I graduated, uh, from high school, you know, in DC, uh, Wilson public high school, and then went to Harvard, um, for undergrad. So, um, wow. that, that was a big change for me. Um, I wasn't really ready, you know, uh, for that, but, um, you know, I, I wanted to find a way to bring hip hop and, and the culture that I was, you know, so much a part of and in love with, you know, into, into Harvard, so to speak. So, um, I was able to create a radio show on the station, which broadcast throughout the Boston area, had a big signal. Uh, they were playing almost all classical music. But uh, I was able to get a, a late night spot on the weekends to play hip hop. And uh, that really gave me the connection to the community. People who were listening were all over the Boston area. Um, people that loved hip hop, looking for you know, a way to hear new music, find out information. And so through that radio show, um, I created The Source as a newsletter, a single yellow front and back Xerox sheet that I mailed out to a thousand hip hop fans in the Boston area that I had built a mailing list of some of the listeners to my radio show. And, um, you know, it went from one page to six pages to 16 pages. I spent the last two years of college focusing on building the source, not going to classes. I did still graduate, (laughs) but you know, that became my life. I mean, what course really combined, you know, my entrepreneurial spirit, you know, I'd always been, you know, somebody that was trying to hustle and find ways to make money when I was younger, growing up, uh, different things, different little businesses and things like that. And um, so I was looking, you know, for, for, for something to apply that to. And then, you know, this was the music and the culture that was you know, so important and uh, so much a part of my life was my life, you know, at that at that time. Um, so, so to combine those two things was was, you know, really great for me. And, you know, I just put all my focus into trying to create uh, initially what I would call the rolling stone of the hip hop generation. Uh, that was sort of the first model. And then later, as the source grew and I began to think of it as a brand and to diversify it, you know, I would say I'm building the Time Warner of the hip hop generation. And, you know, at that time, Time Warner was this huge uh, multimedia company that had, you know, magazines and TV shows and TV networks and movies and all these different things. And, you know, that was really the vision I was pursuing uh, with the source as time went on. Man, listen, man, like, yeah, your story is incredible. And I kind of want to break this down because I think there's also a a key part of your story where you're just like a master connector and also but understanding, you know, how, you know, what you were creating, how it connected to the culture and then getting the buy in for so many people. When you look back at creating the source, you talked about it, right, going from six pages to 16 pages. How did you know as an as you were in the process of creating that? How did you know that, you know, people wanted more? Like, how did you recognize that? Um, I think, you know, really just being in touch with the people and the community, being out, you know, going out to the concerts and going out to, you know, just going out to the, you know, to the hood and and seeing what was going on out there. And uh, like I said, the listeners calling into the radio show and talking to them and hearing what they were interested in. And then as 
the magazine started, you know, feedback from uh, people that would write letters to us. And, uh, you know, the source spread like really fast. I built up this distribution network of, of uh, hundreds and hundreds of mom and pop record stores around the country. Back then, you know, we had uh, mom and pop record stores in every community. You had at least, you know, one store. Everybody went to get their, their music. And, you know, that became the, the hub for the source. Uh, first several years of distribution was all through uh, record stores. But, um, you know, it really got us out to, to the people and people, you know, responded to the content and they would either write to us or they would tell the owner of the record store. I mean, you know, and I call the record store and I oh, mean, we sold out of a hundred copies of the source this month already. And you know, this is crazy. And, you know, so just, just that, you know, naturally just kept happening and, and I just kept and building it. Um, you know, in the nineties, the source, uh, outsold Rolling Stone became the number one selling music magazine on newsstands in the world. Uh, you know, we were in probably uh, 30, 40 countries around the world. Mm. The source really helped to bring hip hop uh, to the international community. There's so many people that grew up in different countries around the world that their only way of learning about hip hop was from the source magazine. Um, so, uh, yeah, man. That's, that's dope, man. I, I think there's so many people right now uh, that listen to this show. They're up and coming entrepreneurs. They're creating their businesses and they're trying to connect the dots. Right. You just spoke to having the ability to outsell Rolling Stone. And I think a key player to that is identifying, OK, who gets the cover? Right. Like who, who gets the cover? Who gets the attention when it came yeah. to picking those covers? Because right now I know our audience in their bedrooms, they have some of the artists that you're talking about that were on the cover of your magazine. Like when it came to picking that person, how did you guys go about selecting that? Uh, well, you're, you're right on the money with that. I mean, the covers were, you know, the single most important thing for the magazine as a whole every month, because because we weren't. Uh, we didn't have a subscription, a uh, huge subscription, like most magazines survived off of subscriptions and didn't sell as many on newsstands. We were we were the opposite. So the newsstand is all about the cover. Somebody walking by, going down the aisle, whatever at the at the counter and they see something that catches their attention. So, um, you know, I think we went about it. Generally, what, what we found worked was we like to do covers right around the time that a new album was dropping. You know, mm. back in those days, it was much more of a lead up to an album. Now that, you know, artists just come out and drop the album, you know, maybe they drop a single a week or two ahead of time or, or what have you, but it was much more time involved building up. So by the time a particular album came out, there was a lot of anticipation and uh, people, oh, you know, the new Nas album is coming or the new, you know, NWA album is dropping. And so uh, we would time the covers a lot with these big releases. Um, and, you know, we would go in and we would listen to these records, you know, before they came out and, you know, be able to, you know, really kind of see, you know, who had the best music. And, you know, we were, you know, we were really passionate about it. I mean, the editors at, at the source and the writers, I mean, these were all young people in their, you know, teens or early 20s. You know, we gave a lot of, you know, opportunities to people, um, you know, who, who might not have had them at other uh, magazine companies. And uh, but, the you know, everybody just loved hip hop and really believed in what we were doing and, and, and took it really seriously. Absolutely, man. I think what's also key is the fact that not only did you guys take it seriously, you were able to take a physical product, right, a magazine and turn it into one of the most iconic events. When I think about like the East Coast, West Coast beef, I, one of the very first things that come to my mind is what was happening at the Source Awards. Could you break it down for me, right? When the East Coast, West Coast beef was happening, how important or, or what was it that you guys realized that, OK, you know what? We are a key indicator for what's happening right now in the culture because people are responding. And guys, if you're watching this on YouTube, you can see uh, right behind Dave is the iconic photo of Tupac himself. So where were you guys at when that happened and how important do you think it was for the culture to see it all play out at like the Source Awards? Well, yeah, the Source Awards uh, was was a huge thing for hip hop when we first uh, created it. You know, I started it really in 91 and it was like a day on Yo! MTV Raps where we would 
pass out a few awards. But 94, I was able to finally turn it into a full, you know, event with 5,000 people at the theater at Madison Square Garden. Uh, it didn't become televised until 95, um, you know, the next year. But initially, you know, there was nobody recognizing hip hop. And I really wanted to create uh, a, a forum where you know, first we could all come together as a community, everybody from the different labels, from, you know, this part of the country, that part of the country, everybody had their own contributions and kind of, you know, let's all get together. This is something that, you know, we can do for our culture and our industry because we see that, you know, the rest of the mainstream or whatever isn't really, you know, messing with us. Um, so I was able to get the buy-in and the support of the Suge Knights, of the, you know, uh, Jay Prince's, the Master P's, the, uh, mm. you know, the Russell Simmons's, the P Diddy's, you know, Puff, et cetera, um, to really, you know, support uh, this whole idea of the Source Awards. So there was a ton of excitement around it in the beginning. Um, and, you know, it went on to become you know, a fixture where it was like the, the Super Bowl of hip hop. You know, it was the one thing that everybody in hip hop looked forward to every year. Uh, and then, you know, we expanded it from just an award show into an awards weekend some years later down in Miami. And, you know, we had tens of thousands of people coming down to Miami for a weekend with all kinds of other activities. And again, just bringing the hip hop community together to celebrate, you know, our culture and, and the incredible achievements and the credible people and creativity and brilliance that goes into the hip hop culture. Um, and uh, yeah, that's, that's, that's the source award still, still <laughs> stands today. I've had so many iconic moments. Man, listen, let's talk about iconic moments, right? Is there like one that comes to your mind, right? When you think about the social wars, like what's one iconic moment you can share with us right now in our audience? Well, I mean, you know, there's the, the big ones that probably your audience knows of, you know, the 95 awards. I mean, you know, uh, Outcast winning for new group of the year um, and uh, uh, going up to receive the award there in a kind of hostile environment yeah. in, in, in those days. You know, New Yorkers really weren't taking to music still from most of the other parts of the country, West Coast, and definitely not the South yet. Um, so being at the audience uh, was a lot of people from New York because, you know, uh, it was 5,000 people in there that came a lot from the New York area. Um, you know, they didn't, they didn't, you know, necessarily get it or appreciate it. So, of course, you know, there was some booze and, you know, that gave us that moment where, you know, we really... Uh, you know, where Andre 3000, you know, uh, just, you know, stepped it up and said, hey, you know, the South got something to say. Um, and, you know, boy, was he right. I mean, the South has gone on from that point and, you know, been the dominant region for hip hop ever since. Um, so, you know, that's one of, of, of many. Yeah, I mean, can you imagine that, right? Like the hostile crowd, the guys are probably right now looking for that viral clip on YouTube to, to say that in that particular scene it is absolutely amazing. Like so many people right now, right, they are building something, right? They, they're, I have Dave Mays on a the show. They have the idea. They, they want to create something like the source, but they have to also realize that, you know, things happen, right? Things happen, things to look out for. When you look back at something that didn't go as you want it to, as planned, like what comes to your mind? Was there ever a moment where you're like, you know what? This magazine isn't working out. I'm ready to move on. Um, so, I mean, you know, there, there were definitely um, mistakes that I made along the way that I have learned from and, you know, mostly recognized, you know, after the fact. Um, I, I did a lot of things well and, and accomplished a lot, but, but also made a lot of big mistakes. So, you know, for me, it's, it's been about learning from those, understanding, you know, what caused those. And, you know, some of it was uh, just having such a great amount of success at a young age. You know, uh, I started the source when I was 19. Wow. Uh, and uh, it just, you know, it grew and, you know, I didn't go to, you know, I went to Harvard. I was a government major. You know, I didn't go to business school. I didn't know about any of this stuff. So, you know, I was learning, figuring things out as I went along. But, you know, when you have a, a lot of success at, at a young age and things are, are rolling, you know, I think sometimes, you know, you can uh, think everything is going to work 
uh, every idea you have. Um, so I think just, you know, learning to have the right people around me that can really uh, support my vision, but also, you know, be able to contribute to the vision and be able to, um, you know, let me know sometimes when I might be getting a little too carried away, you know, with something and, and you know, pull me back in. So, you know, I'm, I'm really excited about the team that I've got around me as I launch this new business this time. Um, you know, I want to recognize my my business partner, Kendrick Ashton, who's just an incredible person. Kendrick is, a, you know, a super accomplished businessman in his own right. Um, former investment banker, you know, founder, uh, co-founder of a very successful investment bank in New York and started uh, an incredible uh, business in the Washington, D.C. area back in 2018 called the St. James. It's a place unlike anything else uh, that you've ever seen when mm. you visit the St. James. Um, and uh, I got introduced to Kendrick a few years ago in D.C. at an event, and we just started talking and, you know, we kind of really hit it off and became friends. And, you know, I started telling him about some of the ideas I was having for creating a new platform for the hip hop community. And, you know, Kendrick loves hip hop. And uh, so he's he's one uh, who's, who's really, you know, ex I'm really excited to have. And then I got to shout out my my lady, uh, my, the love of my life, her name is Brett Jeffries. And, um, you know, Brett and I have been together now for uh, over five years. And she's just an incredible woman that's really helped uh, change my life. And, um, you know, she's contributing also greatly to what I'm doing. And with Breakbeat, Brett has a, a background uh, working with Oprah Winfrey, mm. uh, producing producing and developing programming for years uh, there and has done a lot of other things. And so creatively and, you know, marketing and other ways, she's really uh, somebody that I can count on both to be there, you know, for me personally, but also, you know, that I really trust, you know, on the business side, her, her instincts about uh, things. So, uh, you know, there's a number of other uh, great folks that I've already been able to pull together on the different podcast projects and, you know, really great team of different producers and writers um, that, that are working uh, on all the different shows right now. So I know it's going to, you know, prove to be a, just a, a fertile environment like the source once was for not only discovering, you know, rappers through Unsigned Hype, but there's, you know, dozens of people, executives and people that are, you know, in TV or movies or media or all kinds of, you know, fields uh, today at a very high level that that started, you know, at the source. Um, you know, we discovered Tyson Beckford, you know, gave him his first modeling job. You know, <laughs> I discovered uh, Aaron Magruder of the Boondocks and helped really bring the Boondocks out to to a national uh, audience. And, um, you know, so many different uh, executives. Uh, Dream Hampton started at the source, who's you know, doing all these big TV shows uh, and many other great, um, you know, Mike Elliott that's uh, written some uh, some of your favorite movies and still doing his thing out in, in Hollywood. And uh, Carlito Rodriguez, who's uh, been a writer on Empire and mm. uh, uh, Selwyn Hines, who's doing just amazing things in Hollywood now, uh, writing and producing uh, scripted t series, movies, uh, Riggs Morales, you know, VP of a and at Atlantic Records. Wow. I mean, the list goes on and on of people that are really uh, doing amazing things and, and kind of started uh, at the source. Man, I like, I like that conversation because it's, it's bridging the gap, right? It's bringing all these different things together. Like, you get, you're also the, the co-founder of, of Hip Hop Weekly. And what I like about you as well is that you're like a, a media visionary. You can kind of see where media is about to go. When COVID hit, right, let's be honest, a lot of people in the hip hop game, they had to figure out different ways to make money. They had to figure out different ways to get attention. Looking at, you know, you with you being a visionary, what would be your advice to, you know, someone right now that's listening to this podcast that is trying to get more of that media exposure now with the new current times? What advice would you give them to try to gain more exposure? Um, well, I think, you know, we're at a really exciting time of a lot of opportunity because the digital media world has 
huge as it is, and as many big players as there are, it's also a world that's constantly changing um, from a business standpoint. When you talk about media, um, you know, the future of how media companies are going to make money and be structured is still something that's being, you know, reinvented and revisualized. And I, I think, you know, even the biggest companies don't necessarily know for sure where things are going to be five or 10 years down the road. And, you know, you really can create something, uh, you know, you can go in your, you know, your basement tonight and work up some, you know, you know, uh, plan or some business and, and it could take off and it could be competing with Facebook in you know, two, three years down the line. It, it, it is possible uh, right now. Um, and, you know, to do with less resources than you ever needed, you know, you don't have to have, you know, a hundred million dollars to launch a, a television channel or whatever, you know, a magazine, or, you know, things like that. So, um, you know, I think it's, it's, it's a time where, creativity and innovation uh, can flourish and um, that people should, you know, pursue those uh, passions um, if they have them. And, um, you know, I think you, you have an opportunity to really, really succeed. Absolutely. I mean, you're in a whole new age, man. I like the fact that you mentioned that, you know, Dave, I want to ask you the question and we've asked this question to everybody who's ever been on a podcast, whether you graduated or perhaps you didn't even graduate at all, fam. And you're trying to answer the question. We have all asked ourselves the question of the podcast school's over. Now what, what advice would Dave Mays give? Uh, so when you finish school, what do you do next? Is that the question? Yep. Okay. Um, well, I mean, everything depends on, on your situation, you know, what options you, you may have. Um, you know, I think school is, is still uh, a very important um, ingredient to success in, in, in our society. It's not necessary. There's, uh, you know, you certainly can um, create something on your own without uh, having, you know, all the degrees, et cetera. Um, but, um, you know, I think you got to try to find, uh, something obviously that can support, you know, whatever your financial needs may be and, and try to find a way to balance that, um, you know, with something that you may be passionate about. I mean, if you're fortunate to be in a situation where you can pursue something, um, that you're passionate about on your own, um, then by all means, you know, I, I would say go for that. Um, otherwise, you know, people have to do a lot of different things these days, you know, so you may have a job, you know, doing one thing, you know, a certain number of hours a week, but the other hours of the week, you're, you're, you know, building one or two or three other, uh, you know, businesses or, or things that you, you want to work on. So, um, yeah, I think, uh, you know, that's, that's, uh, when, you know, school's out, I mean, time to, uh, you know, time to get things cracking, time to, <laughs> time to make things happen. You know. Absolutely. Absolutely. You heard it first from Dave. I mean, it's time to make things happen. It's time to get the ball rolling. What better time than now? Listen, Dave, I appreciate having you on the show. You absolutely crushed it, man. Somebody right now is listening. They want more of you, though. They want to know what you got coming up next. Give us all of like your social media platforms and how can we best find you? Well, thank you. I really appreciate that. Well, first thing I'll say is the Dave Mays show is coming. That's one of the podcasts uh, that I'm releasing through Breakbeat um, later this month. So that'll be an opportunity for people to actually get to, you know, hear my perspectives and opinions and watch me in conversations with some of the, you know, most influential people in, in the culture, um, et cetera. So, um, you know, Breakbeat, you can find at breakbeatmedia.com. That's kind of the hub, the website where you can kind of get a look at all the different shows and things that we, we have and the one, some of the ones that are coming up. And you can find links there to our social media. Um, but we're on YouTube. We have the Breakbeat Media YouTube page where you can watch uh, the Don't Call Me White. I just launched last week. I mean, she's amazing. Uh, you guys will love that show. Uh, we just launched Culturati today. You can find that on Apple, Spotify, any of your podcast uh, apps. And again, you can go to the website uh, for links to that as well. Um, and, 
Yeah, I mean, I'm at uh, at the real Dave Mays on Instagram and Twitter. Uh, if anyone wants to follow me, and we're at Breakbeat Media on Instagram and Twitter for uh, for Breakbeat. Man, I love it, man. You absolutely crushed it once again, guys. For those of you who have been listening, always remember: dream it, believe it, go out and get it. Hey, what's up, fam? Thanks for watching. Don't forget, hit that subscribe button, smash that like button. We'll see you next week here at Schools Over Now What. And always remember, dream it, believe it, go out and get it.